It's a great pleasure for me to come up here and talk about experiential luxury, design, trends, and how they relate to our industry. An industry that's really inundated with a lot of information, and, and all that information is, is driven from different sources. Experiential luxury, to me, is, is really the, the luxury and the richness of the experience uh, rather than an experience more for the rich. That's what it's become. Everybody is entitled to feel good about what they do in their own homes and how they experience these things in their own homes. They experience it all in different ways. Now, what complicates things is that in our industry, um, everybody has a different opinion and understanding of design, uh, quality, and even luxury. And that's because it's even complicated further by uh, the media. The media complicates it and confuses our consumers um, by inundating them with information because of their insatiable appetite for content. So there's always a need for what are the trends this month? What's the trends this quarter? What's new? What's exciting? What's the color this year? In my view, there is no correlation between trends and design. I don't subscribe to trends personally in, in, in my business because I don't believe in it. Style is a matter of personal preference. It's you know, got a direct correlation between, um, you know, or it's got a direct correlation with one's level of confidence. That's really what style is. That confidence is what style is about. Trends are driven by the media, and that's unfortunate. And they change constantly. And I'm in the media, and that's the problem, is I fight that all the time, because I'm asked to subscribe to these trends and push them, and I refuse to do that. What's interesting is that there's a definite correlation between design and lifestyle, and that's what it's all about. Lifestyle is where things develop over time. Lifestyle trends are more solid. You can't change them. No matter what you do in the media, you're not going to start changing how people live their lives. So this movement goes on, the lifestyle movement goes on. It might get small deviations because of the trends that the media puts out there, but you're not going to change the direction of that lifestyle trend. And that's what we have to embrace as designers, is we have to understand what lifestyle trend is. And that's always been my conversation with builders and developers. You know, people live differently now. You can't start designing houses the way we did 15 years ago. It doesn't function anymore. It doesn't work. So I relate this to a kitchen space. And I talk about kitchens. I go 50 years ago, or in the 1950s, even longer, this is how kitchens function. They had specific functions. Go in there, cook a meal, get things ready for the family. The family's waiting, serve them, and that's it. And sometime in the 1950s, Cornell University came up with this whole concept of a working triangle, and people started designing these kitchen spaces with the working triangle. And you know, that stuck for a long time. Even today, people are sometimes talking about the working triangle and designing kitchens with the working triangle. It's just simply wrong, because that's not how we live today. How we live today is we have complicated families, a lot of people um, in the one space, not one person using it, sometimes two, sometimes three, sometimes four, and everybody has different interests and different needs, different passions, different interests and excitements. So how we entertain is different. And how we use those spaces is different. So what's the definition of a kitchen today? If I ask people, everybody's going to have a different answer. Is a, is a typical kitchen one that has one dishwasher or two dishwashers? And who's to say that's right? Perfect kitchen for me would have one oven but two steam ovens. I'd like two induction cooktops. I'd love two beautiful big Kohler vault sinks with two faucets on each. Is that gluttonous? I don't know, but that's how I would function in that space because I love to work in there and I don't like conflict in the space. And I'd love two column fr fridges and no freezer, maybe a set of freezer drawers. That's my kitchen. It may not be one for you. So there's no ideal definition anymore for spaces. And then what we find is we have all these individual passions that drive how these spaces are designed, coffee being one of them. And that's just a passion that's developed, a lifestyle trend that's developed over time, just like wine has, a huge lifestyle trend. And not because we're all connoisseurs of wine, most of us, I'm not gonna you know, say that nobody knows about wine, I don't know anything about wine, but I pretend I do often, you know? <laughs> that's just the reality of it, and I'll admit it, that you know, I like to have a wine display in my house. Um, and, and, and I enjoy that because it becomes part of our environment, how we entertain our lifestyle. So incorporating these wine displays are little passions that people have in their homes. Uh, whether it's pets, this is one thing that I learned early on in my life, the importance and the passion people have for pets. In my early 20s, I had convenience stores. 
And in my convenience stores on a Sunday, one lady came in, and we had a delicatessen and we had a bakery. And she came up and ordered two slices of bologna and a Kaiser bun, and she went off taking some other stuff. Came to the cash register and had four cans of cat food, two slices of bologna, and a Kaiser bun. And I just went, wow, the cat's eating better than the kid. And that was a real wake-up call for me. It was amazing what people do for pets. If you don't have a pet, you don't understand. If you don't have kids, you don't understand. So it's important to understand these lifestyle trends, sports being one of them. Whether it's from a family perspective or just an individual need, someone's need to be the best they can possibly be in what they do because the means are there. In my complex where I live, the bedroom ceilings are 15 feet high. One of the people that bought a unit there actually turned one of the bedrooms to a basketball court. That's what he wanted in his house, and that is okay. Um, one of the comments I made early on to a lot of builders is that you've got 400 square feet of space that you take in an average garage. Why don't you do something with it? Why don't we make it usable? Take a look at that room and understand why people don't use it. Why does it not work? It doesn't work because that's where the garbage goes all the time and it smells bad and it's a terrible space. So what do we do? We put the garbage in a closet. We put doors on the closet. We put an exhaust fan in there to create negative pressure, take the odors out. Now you've got 400 square feet that you can create a beautiful space. Why shouldn't it be beautiful? People have their second largest investment in that space. And they love that investment. People love their cars. And it doesn't have to be a Bugatti, it doesn't have to be a Ferrari, it can be any kind of car. It can be a, a basic Chevrolet. People will take the same kind of pride in washing that car as they do a $500,000 car. Because there is no gauge or level to experiential, the term experiential luxury anymore. And I use this example because this gentleman, Manny Cushman, came to the United States uh, from Iran uh, and with nothing, lived in a station wagon with his family, and worked his way up, and through a lot of trials and tribulations, finally made it in, in, in the investment world and real estate world, and he has the luxury to have the house that he wants. Now, his house itself is pretty gaudy and ugly, to be honest with you. It's nothing beautiful, but his garage is spectacular because all he cares about is his cars. And this is not his latest garage. His latest garage is even nicer. So he sits there, his office is in his garage. And if he could have it his way, he would live there forever. And, and, I don't, you know, and who are we to criticize somebody for what their passions and likes are? And now that leads us to design flexibility. If he has the desire to live there as long as he wants to, so does everybody else. And that's something that we're finding more and more is that people want those comforts in a home that provide them the opportunity to live there long. They don't want to move. They want to live there as long as they can and maybe go into a home where they absolutely have to at the end. They want to create a space where they enjoy every day in every sense of the word. And there is no standard definition of family anymore. So couples with children are not the mainstream family anymore. Single, one-person households are actually surpassing couples with children. And single men in a house living alone have gone from 23% to 32% in the last 35 years. So there's more single men living alone. Why? Because everybody's getting divorced. It's easy to get divorced. Uh, people are living longer. And the pressures of living with the perfect family are gone. So there is no perfect family anymore. There is no definition for a perfect family. So those notions that were in place years ago that told us that we have to get married, we have to have kids, we have to live like this, they're gone. And people are realizing, so people are getting divorced. They want more out of their lives. And this is what's happening. And people are actually saying, well, I was out at a hotel, I was at a restaurant, I saw this and I saw that, and why can't I have that in my own house? And you can and we take all these rooms and we do the best thing we can with them. We look at a space and we ask ourselves, how does this space work? And how can we maximize the performance in that space? And this idea of small spaces is no, uh, you know, nothing new to, to the West Coast here. I've seen some beautiful spaces out here in Vancouver where people and designers have been super innovative with making these spaces work. And this is a loft we did in downtown Toronto. It's only about 600, 700 square feet. And it was one gentleman living there, 
and he just wanted it a certain way, and he wanted it to function in every sense of the word for him. And small spaces are becoming more and more prevalent. Why? Because we want to maximize what we can get out of everything we do. The whole notion of having a lot of things is going out the door. People want less things, but they want things that matter more to them, and they improve their experience of life. That's what it's about. When people are decluttering more, they have less things, but whatever they buy, they're very selective, and those things that they buy actually affect the way they live and improve the way they live. And in, in that whole notion of living better comes health. And that is a big movement. Uh, probably in the last three to four years, it's been a huge shift to veganism. I mean, veganism has been around probably more so on the West Coast than anywhere else in Canada, but just in general around the world, I became a vegan three years ago, and, and, and it kind of opened my eyes up, and I've seen this huge shift in veganism and, and just living better and people worrying about their healths. And there's been some things that have happened lately where some of the big um, agricultural companies and, and um, um, pharmaceutical companies have had some big, massive uh, judgments against them. And that is empowering people uh, saying, we're not going to take this where we're getting sick. We will control our own food. We will control our own health. And we want to live longer. We want to live better. And that's all what embodies the whole term experiential luxury. It's not about money. It's not having expensive things. It's about having what you want, when you want it, where you want it, the way you want it. And that's what it's about. It's about having a home that you can live in that works for you rather than having a home that you work for. In the past, it was always a home that required maintenance. It was always a home that required work, endless work. Uh, cut the lawn, do this, uh, do that. And about 10 years ago, I did a project. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to take every room, I'm going to look at this room, and I'm going to think to myself, how does this room fail in its function for me? Where does it fall short? And how can I make it better? And every time you make a room better, it's just, it doesn't end there. There's more technology that comes down the road. There's more you know, ideas that come down the road. There's more products that come down the road that enable you to even make it better still. And you know, this house that I did had five levels to it. And all the bathrooms and the bedrooms were on the top level. And one of my pet peeves is walking into a washroom and waiting for the water to get warm. So I put a recirculating line on, on the house. There's nothing new to anybody. Um, but I put a motion sensor in every bathroom. As soon as you walked in, the recirculating line would go on, circulate the water. As soon as you got to the shower or the sink, the water would be warm. And then when you left, it would stop recirculating. So you wouldn't waste energy. It's about the little things. You often hear in business, it's the last 10% of people's experiences that, that, that either um, leave them with a good taste in their mouth or destroy what all happened. You know, um, it's all those little things that drive you nuts about a space that ruin the experience. So that's what we got to look at, is all those little things and making that space perform as best as it possibly can. And then, you know, items like quartz countertops. Why has there been a huge shift towards quartz countertops in the last seven years? Because people still love the look of natural materials, but quartz offers something that natural stone doesn't which is less maintenance. So you can cook the way you want to, you can beat it up the way you want to, and you don't have to worry about uh, staining it, etching it, and, and maintaining it. And that's what it's about. Maximizing the use of uh, storage spaces, uh, laundry rooms, uh, separating, putting dedicated spaces that function better for you. Um, one of my biggest pet peeves, and I couldn't get this across to builders back then, was why are you putting laundry rooms with mud rooms? They need to be separated. They need to be individual spaces. Make them the best they can be. And then security and automation is something that whether you like it or not, it's part of our lives in every way, shape, or form. Some people still have a hard time um, embracing this concept. They're afraid of it. Uh, but once they start getting educated, I've got a client, we're doing a, a, a really big home in, in Burlington, Ontario, and right off the bat he said, I don't want any voice assistance, I don't want anybody listening to me, I don't want nothing like that in my house. And that was three months ago. Now, we're automating the house, we're putting voice assistance in, uh, assistance in, we're putting sound in, we're putting everything in his house. Because he's understanding that it is safe. He's understanding that if it's managed right and it's put together properly, it is safe. 
and, and it is going to enhance his experience in this house. And items like that safe drawer, which is really something from hospitality. These, this is a safe drawer from hospitality, but every walk-in closet we do has one of these in it. So it's a matter of convenience for people. Things like passports and just items that you don't want laying around, like checkbooks, go into that safe. It's not a high security safe by any means in the sense that it's not a fireproof safe. But yeah, you can have that, but it answers a common problem. So you take a look at how people live, all the little quirks that bother them, and you give answers to those things. And then you create an environment that really answers to that whole concept of having that wonderful experience within a space. You know, how many times are you in a kitchen and you wish you had access to your computer right there while you're doing things? And people do, they have a computer there, they have a screen there, they have an iPod stand. But this projects an image on a countertop and it becomes a touch screen. So you can actually touch the countertop and operate it and it's very intuitive. So we build that into a backsplash and it projects an image onto a countertop. So you now have a countertop that you can actually work on um, cook on, throw things on, knead dough on, doesn't matter, and you have a touch screen that you can access and look at recipes. So it's about understanding technology, and I always say there's, there's no limit to the technology available today. The only limitation is what's in our minds. And I also say to a lot of my designers in the office, we're designing spaces for people. Everybody's different. And you can't design spaces by putting limitations on the ideas yourself. Um, we are not the ones to say, well, geez, you know, we can't put two dishwashers in. That's ridiculous. Why are you going to spend that kind of money? Who's going to spend that kind of money? That's not for us to answer. What we need to understand is who the client is, how they live, what is def their definition of lifestyle, what is their lifestyle, and then our job is to render a space for its ultimate purpose that offers that client the opportunity to really enjoy that space to its fullest. That, to me, is the definition of experiential luxury. And then lastly, sustainability is something that's becoming more and more prevalent. Um, unfortunately, we don't see it embraced in consumers as much as we hope to. Luckily, we see it embraced greatly in, in, um, in, in corporations. They're really embracing this concept, which is fantastic. But I think that's one of the lifestyle trends that's becoming more and more prevalent and, and hopefully will take hold as we move along. Thank you very much. I'm going to clear the stage for the next speaker. Thank you.